Thank you, Jesus. It says in Philippians 4 and 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And, and so we use our connection card here uh, as a tool uh, to bring prayer requests in. And so we're going to pray over some of those requests that we have this week. I'm just going to read a few of them out. Uh, and you can make those requests today if you have any. And we'll pray about them throughout the week and, and next week. Uh, at our gathering we saw uh, somebody just praying and believing that God would touch a friend with, who's just recently been diagnosed with cancer um, we have somebody praying for their son who's just trying to find his way and maybe struggling a bit right now we're believing for that that God would help that young man somebody here just praying for a brother uh, that he would find a way forward in his life to salvation to purpose to good mental health. Uh, another person just requesting prayer for a miscarriage uh, and just praying that God would just heal their heart uh, and keep their heart open and bless them. Uh, and so right now, you're just going to pray. And if you, if you feel comfortable, you can raise a hand as a sign of agreement. Uh, and let's literally just enter into prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to come and just to touch these situations and to move in Jesus' name. God, we just, we bring every request before you. We bring every person behind each request before you. We bring every person that's being prayed for before you, God. And we just ask that person um, who's maybe struggling right now with health and cancer. God, we just pray in Jesus' name. We know you're a healer. God, we know that you can heal. But we also know you can use this situation to bring people to faith in you. And so, God, we ask for you to move by your mighty name. We pray for that young son uh, who is struggling to find his way. God, we just pray, Father, you, you would bring a holy interruption into his life, Father. Bring a person, a brother, a father, a person to, who can help guide that man and show him who he truly is through your lens. We just pray for that brother who is lost and, and needs to find purpose and find a home. And you, he needs to find you to find a new way of living. And we just pray, Father, for open eyes and an open heaven. We pray for that, that, that young woman who experienced a miscarriage. God, we just pray, God, you would heal her heart. You would encourage her heart. And you would help her to move forward, Father. And you would use the situation for your good. In your mighty name, we pray. Amen. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Okay, it so says in Psalm 100, verses 4, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And so we enter into God's courts, into his presence, through what? Thanksgiving. And so we're going to just praise God for a few things right now. Just praise God for salvation last week. A, a man put his hand up uh, to put God first. And so we're just thankful uh, that there's people coming to faith. Still, that the gospel still works. It still brings hope. It still brings healing. Uh, we're also thanking God for uh, just a young man coming back on track just this week, been struggling with addiction, uh, just maybe letting go of some things in the past, uh, and he's, he's made a recommitment uh, as I had a conversation this week. And then just thanking God for a new car park, some extra space, less chance of bangs, hopefully, and dents. Uh, and listen, you know what it is? It's, it's prophetically creating space for God to move. It's not just a car park, it's space for God to move in people's lives. Can you get an amen? Let's worship one more time.
God, we come to you this morning with a heart full of devotion to you. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross for our sins, that you humbly took our sins when you went to Calvary. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome. Why don't you all take a seat there, get comfortable. Um, it is my privilege to welcome you all to church this morning. My name's Rachel. I serve in the team here. It's great to see you all out, and we have a great service in store for you today. Um, I just wanted, before we get stuck in, to direct your attention to these on your seats when you came in. These are our um, welcome packs. Within them is our connection card. So if you're new to the church, um, why don't you fill one of them in and pop it to the Connect desk on the way out. It's a great way to get involved and um, to become part of the family here. So I um, encourage you to fill that in if you are new. But before we get stuck in, why don't you turn around and welcome someone to church with a hi-fi handshake or hello. My grandson, there was a six-year-old in that photo. Did we play the Serve Day video? Great. Okay, so Serve Day is coming up on the 22nd of this month. So it's a Saturday, literally for an hour or two. And honestly, it's, we had a great time last year, and we really want the whole church to come out, kids, the whole lot. We're going to do simple things like litter pick in the town. Um, and there's always food after, but it's honestly, you'd be surprised how much of a blessing it is and how much you come away feeling great about yourself. Not that that's the reason you do it, but there's just something in us as people that's just wired to serve. I honestly believe that. And you'll shock yourself if you come and literally just do something just for really only one reason, and that's just to serve and represent Jesus in our local area. And so Adam has done a great job just getting some gardens. We're going to do these gardens. We're going to do all sorts of different things. We're starting to think of creative ideas. I think we're meeting tomorrow night, uh, me, Adam, and Rachel. And that's where Adam and Rachel met too. How about that? Now they're, now they're leading the thing. Come on. So, so there's all sorts of things happening on a serve day. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Bring your friends. <laughs> Make them half promises. You know, you never know who might be there as you bend down to pick that litter up. Um. <laughs> all kinds of men. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, there's Lorraine, just put her hand up for any of the older men. Yeah. Right, do you, not, you, don't, you don't want younger, Lorraine? No, just no. Uh, like an older man? Okay, mature. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, it's going to be a great time, so make sure, pencil that in your diary. It's going to be 10 a.m. for maybe an hour or two. Just come for as long as you can, but come from the start. And honestly, 
It's going to be a great day. Well, today we have a special message. We just finished our Holy Spirit series. This message is a message that I've heard years ago. And I always thought, why have more churches uh, not been able to get this guy? Unfortunately, now it's impossible because he passed on. Um, and we've just, the world has just celebrated a month, uh, celebrating pride. And you know what? Uh, as a church, we celebrate humility. <laughs> and here's the reality. There's a lot of people, and the world is t- telling us and speaking loud about topics which are very confusing to people. And listen, people do struggle with their identity, and it is very confusing. And our church is completely welcoming to anyone from any position, from any background, from any identity uh, that they're currently in. And we want those people to come to church, but sometimes, probably for years, the church has not really had many answers for those kinds of people or didn't really know how to guide them. And it, because it's so complex and the world is still trying to figure that out. And thankfully, we're more sensitive to people um, who, who there's, you know, gender confusion, all those kind of things. And so we don't want to be harsh about it, but, but I think it's important we speak about it. Can get an amen? And, no, you know, there's certain people that can speak about these things better than just someone who's given theory from the front. You know, the Bible says that's great. And, of course, that's important. This guy, Cy Rogers, has lived it. He then became a pastor, and so it's a, honestly, take notes. It's going to be up on our YouTube channel. Thank you to Wave Church in California who recorded this. And we're going to play a video right now, and honestly, it's it's an incredible message. Might be a wee bit, parents, you might <laughs> have a few awkward conversations afterwards. But listen, this is what I believe. I believe if we're not talking to the next generation, the youth, the world will. The media will, their friends will, the toxic websites will, and so we're better than to talk about this stuff than in church with a godly perspective, and so youth, this one's for you. Listen up, pay attention, don't play axiosies, take the phones off them now. I'm telling you, this is an incredibly important message. Okay? Are you ready for it? You're like, oh my goodness, buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> this is a roller coaster. Okay, so what's, Sai has just been invited to the stage, and he's, he's in the middle of uh, showing people a picture of his family. He's now married. He's been married for 37 years. Uh, but as he talks about, he has some residue. There might be some, the way he talks, you'll kind of get where he came from. Uh, and some of his struggles. He's explain that in a second. So let me just pray. God, I just pray and thank you, Father, for your word that has power, that has truth, that has the ability to free us. I thank you for Sai's uh, testimony and his life. And I just pray, Father, we would have ears to hear right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at, Look at my grandson. There was a six-year-old in that photo. There in the middle panel, that little innocent kid, six years old. Can I tell you how grateful to God I am, that he has never had to say the things I'm about to say by the time I was six years old. That he has lived a life loved, healthy, stable, invested. And while I can't change my history, he exists because God bought for me freedom and a chance to make new history. And so, by the time I was six, I had already been sexually violated by an adult man. A family friend who taught me things God did not want me to know, betraying my dad's trust. And then my mom was killed in a car wreck. She went shopping and never came home. And then I'm separated from my dad, the last anchor of validation and security in my life. And all of it by the time I'm six. So you can imagine with the foundation like that, it might not go well. And it didn't. And I began to be labeled, growing up on the buckle of the Bible belt in the land of beer drinking, skirt chasing, gun toting, pickup driving, boot wearing, good old boys. And I love that stuff. But there was an expectation that I was not living up to. And at about seven, I began to hear the litany that I was a loser as a male, a failure in my gender. I'm sure you can imagine the more colorful rhetoric. And I didn't understand it first, but soon I would. And in addition to this mistreatment, there was also a wealth of people around me who didn't know what to do, even if they were empathetic. Most of my classmates did not know.
mistreat me. And yet I'm sure that while there were people there who, who you know, wanted to help or be empathetic toward my plight, they didn't know what to say, including the grown-ups, so no one said anything. And thus the power of the bully prevailed as the most authoritative voice in my life. And so I tried to be one of the guys. I was on swim team and football team and track team. I was an Eagle Scout. I went hiking in the Rocky Mountains. I had two motorcycles. I went dirt bike riding. I went horseback riding. I volunteered to join the U.S. military. And so I could do anything any boy could do, but it didn't resolve my crisis. It didn't validate me in my great depth of need. And, of course, I had already become sexually promiscuous by the time I was a teenager because I had learned pretty quickly that bad love is better than none. I was willing to trade off my moral teeth teachings and I was willing to trade away any sense of dignity in order to find validation through exploitation. A lot of people do that. And so I believed in the God of the Bible, maker of heaven and earth. I believed in Jesus, the Messiah, redeemer of humanity. I didn't have a problem with his existence. I had a problem with his character dressed up in the skin of others who made me feel like I could never measure up. And in spite of all my efforts to try, I, I came to the conclusion that God may love other people, but he apparently doesn't love me. Look at the litany in my life. How could I call that love of a personal caring God that I heard about in Sunday school? I didn't have the rest of the story. So we are not surprised that my life spun out. And I lived a double life while I was in the military. And then I went out into the life beyond the military. And I was involved in a world that was boundaryless and self-indulgent, trading sex for validation. It may seem sinful to you, but it met my needs better than anything or anyone had yet. And what kind of a commentary is that? Even confused about gender, pursuing gender reassignment almost two years, and just when you think I'm too deep in the ditch, just when you think I'm undeserving, that's when God rocked up 40 years ago. And in that encounter, he opened my eyes to a new understanding. Why am I not a Buddhist? Why am I not a Marxist? Why would I crucify my flesh and swim against the tide of popular culture and, and passion in here? Why? It wasn't for singing songs. It wasn't for church services. It wasn't for religious rituals. It wasn't for your moral standards. I could have cared less. But my eyes were open to God in a new way, where he was no longer a code of ethics to debate. He was no longer some philosophical point of view to ponder with the chattering classes at university over a cup of coffee. He now became a real life person, not another option on the spiritual buffet, but a real live presence. And in light of that, how was I going to live my life? He did not come into my life and say, you stop living like that. He said these words, my son. Think of it, my. I'll own you. I put my name on you. I'm not ashamed of you. I'll make you a public relations ambassador for who I am. I'll put my Holy Ghost in you. I'll make you so clean because of Christ, I can put my spirit in this temple. I'll own you. I understand you. I have compassion for you. I see the whole picture, not just the naughty over here. It's the why the naughty even happened. I look beyond the sin to see the need, like the old song says. My son, whatever hijacked your misunderstandings, whatever took advantage of you and misdirected you, however other people labeled you and spun you out and exploited you and made you doubt yourself, I never intended your gender to be a curse and a burden. I intended it to be a blessing through you to others. So ladies, whoever ripped you off and made you full of self-doubt. Whoever made you think your gender is something less, I think that's not the voice of the Holy Ghost, and he has good things to say to help you walk in a greater freedom. So I cannot live like my past never happened. I wish I could just say God waltzed into my life and waved a magic wand and turned me into the Vin Diesel lookalike you see today. <laughs> Took some time and push-ups to get there, but... I have learned to grow beyond the power of my past. And listen, getting married, someone with a background like that, that doesn't prove anything. Anybody can live a double life. We all know people who do. I don't put that image of my family up there to try to convince you I'm not who I used to be. It's just simply the byproduct of growth. But the goal was never that. The goal is God. He's the source. That's what completes me. 
My family is a beautiful outworking, a, a glorious byproduct that was unanticipated. But God is your goal. Walk with Him. So, I love to share what took me forward. That helped me walk out freedom in an unlikely place of vulnerability here and in a world of pressure, risk, and opportunity out there to go astray. What kept me? That's what I want to share. And I also get asked a lot of questions in my years of work. You know, I've learned a lot in years of pastoral service, but I have to practice what I preach and teach too. That's the best I know, as said. And I love to answer questions through my own experience. And one of the questions I'm asked the most is, if I'm offered freedom in Jesus and if I'm this new creation, why am I still struggling with things related to my history, my humanity, my past? Why am I still struggling sexually? Because, you know, the fact is, folks, we're not all overcoming, I don't know, anxiety management or anger management here. We're not all overcoming some addictive or abusive process. But all of us in the room and every human on the earth is a sexual creature. And for years, Christianity has not done an adequate job addressing this. And you would agree that not talking, it hadn't made us holier or healthier. But when we talk, we're not here to lament, judge, criticize, reject, or shame. This is a shame-free conversation. So do not be afraid. But we want to paint a picture of God's outstanding advocacy and empathetic understanding and his advocacy and compassion toward us that what does it say in Hebrews he's a high priest who's been acquainted with all that we go through tempted in every way so he knows what we're up against and therefore I can expect to come to his throne of grace I can even approach it with a confidence that says he knows what I'm dealing with and I can approach him and find grace and mercy to help me in my time of need so if there's any other voice here telling you not to run to God, I'd say it's not the Holy Ghost. And so that you may hear him, let's pray and get underway. Lord, take these words as always. Anoint them with life and power to make it more than some infotainment. Make it a revelation about who you are in our lives and who you would like to be in taking us forward into freedom, much more than maybe we've imagined. I believe you would delight to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why is it that we struggle? I thought I'm a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man or woman is in Christ, they become a new creation. The old life passes away. All things become new. Some church cultures have inferred that what that means is in Christ, suddenly like invasion of the body snatchers, it really isn't you anymore. You, you are you plus plus. You're never going to struggle anymore with all of that that used to be a part of you. But then the other part of your experience is the more realistic one that says, wait a minute, I've been born again about 10 minutes. The blood of Jesus did wash away the guilt, but he hasn't washed away the humanity or the vulnerability. Now what do I do about that? In fact, the original Greek grammar and language tense of verb of that verse in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, actually says something more like this. In Christ, a transformative process has been initiated and its process will continue transforming you. Isn't that the way it really is? And I want to share with you what my path of transformation, my path of walking forward in freedom, God provided me by His definition, not my wishful thinking. Struggle, you will. That's how God made life on earth. It's a refining process. It provides focus toward goal. Struggle, the little chicken struggles to hatch out of the very egg that served it in the same way that a mother and baby struggle when the baby's coming down the birth canal. But it's purposeful. My granddaughter learned to walk a year ago. She's two, going on three. She's very charming. But she began walking, you know, as a one-year-old, and in her effort to walk uprightly, she fell down all the time. Now, Karen and I, living in a multi-generational household with her, did not say to her, oh, oh, you're falling down? Don't you know God's developmental goal for you is that you walk uprightly? What a wicked baby! <laughs> Loser! <laughs> it's true that God's developmental goal is that babies learn to walk uprightly, but they're not born doing it. They have to learn how in the face of constant failure because there's an impulse in them. Struggle says I have a capacity for more. I want freedom even if I'm bound right now and I'm going to get there because I am not a slave of sin. I've been switched on to God and there's a capacity in me to take me onward, upward, forward and I'm going to walk in it. And even if I don't know how and I fall down, I'm going to get up and try again because I win the crown if I don't quit whether I run the race flawlessly. Because you're not born again walking uprightly. You're born again with the capacity to learn how. 
But in walking uprightly, we're not doing it so that we can earn God's love. He already loves us. We're not earning righteousness. We can't. We borrow Christ's. But we learn how to walk uprightly as responsible stewards of mind and body. So as has been said, the power of sin has been broken. It's true. I am not a slave of sin anymore. I get to choose to whom and what I bow. Sex used to be a powerful master. God's a more powerful master. I get to choose to whom I bow. The old master may call my name. The new master calls my name. I get to pick to whom and what I give allegiance. Now, I'm not the puppet. The power broken. The penalty paid. That means I can access God. He can access me right now. The freedom begins right now. But to go forward, I have to deal with the propensity. The vulnerability that yet remains. You don't think you've got propensity? You get stuck in traffic under the right circumstances and your propensity will show up. <laughs> but even to deal with propensity, what do we got? We got the high priest Jesus who intercedes. We've got the Holy Spirit inside to empower and guide. And then we've also got the Word of God. The Logos becomes Rhema to make a way clear for us. And, and then God's family, a camaraderie of advocacy around us. God with skin on to help us stay the course. Yes, I may have vulnerability, but there are solutions. And we're going to look at not only the problem, but if there is one, there is solution. Because God is not caught off guard by all this. And He's not up in heaven saying, oh no, what are we going to do? These poor disadvantaged humans good luck to you and so if there is a struggle or a problem in your life do not let it demoralize do not let it shame you out do not let it ever make you think you are disqualified I want to give you some perspective in fact here's a little diagram that does that here's your life going round and round and round and round and you've been to inner healing you've been through deliverance You've read the Bible, you've got the Bible study, you go to home group, you've been to support group, you've been through counseling and all of these things. They are there to serve you and they help you. You've had breakthrough after breakthrough, you've made forward progress, but do you ever find that from time to time you keep coming back around to it? You're normal. Same diagram, a therapist taught me. Same diagram, different perspective to set the stage for our chat. Uh-huh. It'll be partly cloudy today and temperatures returning to seasonal norms. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Having said it, here's the same diagram, but what do you notice here? Here you feel like you're just static ever coming back around to the same old thing here you're going onward upward glory to glory layer to layer making progress and kind of like we heard in conversation already from Sharon that you know when I came to Jesus forget the sex stuff fear was my biggest challenge why not pain and risk loss were not theoretical to me I really could look over my shoulder and accurately say dear Lord what will happen next so when I came to Jesus, fear was a constant companion, a background music so loud I didn't even have perspective. And when I came to Jesus, he didn't just zap that away from my consumer convenience so that I never had a blip on my radar. But as that buttons, you know, I would grow and get some relief and peace and then suddenly the button of fear would be triggered. Only now God was in the equation. What's that beautiful quote by Oswald Chambers a hundred years ago, but it's still true. Fretting is your calculating without God in the equation. And now I'm not a five-year-old victim. Now he's in the equation. And I'm beginning to learn of him. And so I began to fight his intervention. And then I go around the bend again. And I enjoy peace and growth. But then the button gets triggered again. And I feel powerless. But then I have a new mantra from Psalm 56. That when I am afraid, I have learned to trust in you. Oh God, my rock and my redeemer. And you've got my back. You will never let me face anything without your presence with me. And you will bring me through. You begin the good work, you know how. And so along the way, the power of fear lost its power. And if it shows up on the radar, I know how to deal with it instead of it dealing with me. And add to that, I not only learned about my humanity, which gives me compassion for yours out of the struggle, I have compassion for you. And I also have a confidence in God. So while there may be a lot I don't know, I do know that he's been good to me and he has led me forward. And I want to paint the picture of what it looked like. So here we go. Are you ready? You got a problem. You got to see it. You got to identify it so you can 
address it. Many times we struggle because we're murky in the dark. Things are uncertain and unclear. We're not understanding why it is we wrestle. So if we have a propensity that makes us vulnerable and that puts our freedom at risk, well then let's identify it, not to shame, to clarify, yes? So over here, this is why we're vulnerable. Number one, I got a human nature and it's weak. What did the spirit-filled Paul say? The Paul who wrote one-third of the New Testament. What did Paul say? The thing I should not do, I do. And then uh, the stuff I, I don't, I should. Who's going to ever save me from this aspect of my humanity? Thank you, God, for Christ. That's it in a nutshell. In other words... If it's true for the body, it's true for the soul. To paint this picture, I like to give illustrations from science and biology because God makes biology like he makes theology. And there are material examples that help paint a picture of spiritual truths. Therefore, diabetes is a weakness in my family. See, the human nature makes me weak. And weakness in Hebrew language does not mean a character fault. That if you worked harder and prayed more and meant it better, if you studied harder, that you'd rise above all these weaknesses. Because if your effort and enlightenment could generate that outcome, Jesus died in vain. In Hebrew language, the word weakness means disability. You can't fix it. But you can collaborate with Dr. Jesus and manage it. That it doesn't manage you, that you may walk in freedom. So diabetes... I don't have it, but my family line does. So I'm at risk, predisposed. So I've lived a pre-diabetic lifestyle for many years. And now that I am 200, it's really paid off. <laughs> and so, somebody said to me the other day, gee, you look kind of tired, Cy. I said, thanks. I said, I'm, I'm actually not tired. I don't have any more collagen. But um, <laughs> nothing goes back. I sleep on my pillow, I get a crease on my face, and it takes eight hours to massage it. But anyway, weakness means disability, and I think of diabetes. If you have serious diabetes, you know what I'm going to say. It is not presently curable, but it is manageable. But management is tedious. A meal you enjoy without thought can kill a diabetic in four to six hours. So the diabetic has to draw blood before and after every meal, every day, to ensure they're getting their metabolic balance right. Then they have to exercise the cardiovascular system and keep the weight off to make sure that they don't have, you know, a compromised uh, cardiovascular system that results in amputation of hands and feet. They have to pay attention to the urine to make sure kidneys falter properly. They have to pay attention to eyesight to make sure retinas aren't painlessly bleeding and suddenly they go blind. They have to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to keep the balance right. But if they do the tedious drill, it is not futile. There is a tangible, real-world payoff and benefit. They may manage it, it doesn't manage them. But no matter how good they are at managing, according to the doctor's orders, they will never produce their own insulin. They have to depend on the doctor to give them what management doesn't produce. True for your body, true for your soul. In my journey, when I was outside of Christ, I did not think about the things I fed on. I didn't think about the fruit that I produced. I didn't think about any of it in the slack, self-indulgent way I live my life. Then I come to Christ, and Dr. Jesus puts me on a new, narrow regimen. And it is narrow, and it is tedious. And I've got to exercise my faith that it doesn't atrophy. I've got to pay attention to the fruit that I produce to maintain my balance. I've got to pay attention to the things on which I feed. I have to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. But as I do the paying attention, I begin to manage my weakness instead of my weakness managing me. But, but, no matter how good I am at managing, I will never produce my own righteousness and salvation. I got to depend on Dr. Jesus to give me what management does not produce. What am I saying? I'm saying, ladies, I will never be so holy and healed in this life that I outgrow depending on God as my first foundation. I'm the sinner. He's the Savior. I get dirty. He makes me clean. I'm the weak one, but he's the strong one. And he never says, my character is glorified by eliminating all of your weaknesses so you're a superior human compared to everybody else. I'll make you invulnerable. No. Instead, it's you're weak, I'm strong, and my strength is made completed in your weakness, not its elimination. So do not hate your weakness. God will meet you there. He will meet you there. Secondly, 
Well, it's one thing to have vulnerability on the inside, but now we've also got the reality of cultural influences around us. And kind of like fish in the water don't even know they're wet, like a boat in strong current, it's one thing to be vulnerable, but we are also swept along by powerful influences we don't often consciously recognize. And so, whether that's the family of origin, what did they teach you about sex? Did they prepare you for struggle, yearning, burning, longing, lusting? Did your family teach you that if these bad things happen, you're raped, you're touched wrongly and abused, that there is healing and recovery, that it's not that which will really define you? What did your family prepare you for in a culture that talks explicitly through magazines and television and media about sexuality? Is your voice louder than that of the world? Because if it isn't, the world wins by default. And therefore, you know, I think not only do we have uh, family of origin, and I'm not here to fault anybody, none of us are perfect parents, none of us come from perfect homes, but some homes are more intentional and clarified on the mission that you're going to have to learn to drive a car on a dangerous set of conditions, and we want you to drive it well. That's sexuality. We all have the car, how we drive it. So I also think we have peer culture. You know, we've organized our society and educational institutions via age group. And uh, studies have been done about the risk of sexual acting out based on peer group influence. But studies have shown that if the bond between mom and dad is stronger than with peer group, that you will generally survive peer group influence. That you'll be anchored in the swirling current. But what happens is many parents think, oh, my kids don't want to talk to me, and my parents never talk to me, and they'll just roll their eyes. And so parents abdicate instead of becoming more intentional. And thus, when we abdicate, we leave them vulnerable to the only shepherd they've really got, and that's the Pied Piper of popular culture. We live in a media civilization, and by the time your kid turns 16, they've already listened from the age of 4 to 16 to 11,000 hours of television. Television. <laughs> that, does not, that does not count film and music or four more hours a day in social media. They have not had 11,000 hours of meaningful dialogue with God Almighty. They haven't had 11,000 hours of reading the Bible or going to church. They haven't had 11,000 hours of talking to mom and dad about the issues that really matter in shaping their lives. But they've had, since the age of four, the Pied Piper of popular culture, on average, four hours a day. Tell them what's hot, what's not, and how they better comply, or they will not be validated. And for impressionable kids, they are driven by that voice. So when studies of young adult Christians who go to church twice a week reveals they're having sex at the same rate as the pagans, it tells me who they're listening to for their guidance and wisdom in boundary setting and sexual activity. They're not bad, they've been misled. And thank God we've got a shepherd who leads us back on the path to the good stuff. And therefore, we've got to learn to discern his voice above the fray because there is a fray. There are many voices coming at us. Whose voice is the loudest, most influential, most present? Sending kids to church a couple of times a week sounds good, but for 90 minutes a pop compared to four hours a day, it's basically like throwing a wishful pebble at a cultural tsunami. Like the day my daughter came home from school, high school. She put her books down on the dining room table. I was in the kitchen cutting something up. And then she says, so what about masturbation, Daddy? I put the knife down. And then I said to her, as all fathers do in a moment like this, go talk to your mom. <laughs> Actually, I talked with her, and then her mom talked with her. But here's the deal. I'm hardly a perfect dad. I just hope my daughter doesn't write Daddy Dearest one day. But I felt like I had done my job because I would have never talked to my parents. I would have let my culture tell me. I would have let my peer group tell me. And I knew my daughter, she'd already heard what Cosmo magazine said, and she'd already heard what her peer group said, and she already heard what her sex ed curriculum in school said, but now she wanted my opinion to discern through the voices. That's why maintaining the bond, even if they roll their eyes, is better than abdicating. Because when you break through the awkward barrier, it says, hey, I love you enough to give this a try. So I have to learn to discern the voices. And that means, what does it say, Romans 12? Hey, Sai, who you've been listening to? Don't copy the pattern of your pagan culture. I've adopted you into God culture. Copy this path of wisdom. Because you know, frankly, not living out God's sexual advice 
And it's explicit and direct over 30 standards. Not because God loves rules, he loves people. And you don't have to be a Christian or a rocket scientist to recognize that mismanaged sexuality brings terrible consequence. Oh, 50 years ago, the sexual revolution brought us all a lot of casual sex, but it also brought a lot of sexual casualties. And God doesn't love standards, he loves people, but thank God he has a history of redeeming sex and he redeems everything we give to him. That abuse, that abortion, that label, that boundary crossing, those feelings and detractions, he redeems everything we give him, that we can walk in health, wisdom, and freedom. And so, discerning, so I don't copy those things, that means I have to see what the things are the world is saying, and then find out what is God saying. I have to learn to discern truth from lie, Healthy from unhealthy, wisdom from folly, beneficial from detrimental. I have to make those assessments every day in a world of many voices calling my name, wanting my mind, my loyalty, and my money. I have to hear the voice of the shepherd. And Jesus says, my sheep learn to discern it, so start to practice now. You're made to succeed in hearing him. And sigh first, John says, don't, don't believe everything everybody tells you. Don't believe that post or get the rest of the story from that article. And don't just let your hairdresser tell you what your truth is. And don't just allow your friend or your cousin to tell you what you should think about this thing. Instead, discern the spirits. Don't just listen to the teleprompter reader on the news. That's a show. Instead, what is God saying? What's his path of wisdom telling you? Discern it. And Jude verse 4. Beware of people who teach you the grace of God lets you do what you want sexually. Grace gives you room to grow. It doesn't give you license to do what you want. And therefore, you know, I look at a two-year-old and I cannot expect a two-year-old to act like a 45-year-old. I give them grace. They can't help it. We understand their poopy diapers and then when they're 15, they can't help it. They have poopy attitudes. But... <laughs> But when you're 45 and acting like a self-indulgent, boundaryless two-year-old, then there will be trouble, not grace. Then we got biology. Good heavens. Who wouldn't struggle? We've got a setup within us. It's not our fault, and we are not assigning blame. Certainly, God is not. We have the impact of biology upon sexuality and relationship. And so, you know, sexuality is a struggle because our biology sets us up. Not our fault, but we have to reckon with it. So we've got a DNA code in every part of our being. Every fiber, every cell has a DNA code. And the DNA code basically says this, reproduce me, please. So when that young man came to me after a church service and said, I'm one of those Christians. I struggle with my sexuality. I said, oh, you too. We'll get in line with everybody else. Every Christian in every church and every human on the earth, because we got... A DNA code that wants to be reproduced, and it gives us a bit of push. It doesn't make you have sex, but it's kind of like the manufacturer is giving you a car. Where you drive it and how you drive it is up to us, but there are circumstances that make us drive certain ways. So we have a DNA code, and there can be some predisposition within us towards sex. But just because there's a predisposition, what was it G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis said very well about Mother Nature giving you a predisposition? A hundred years ago they said this. Just because Mother Nature gives you a predisposition doesn't make it natural nor normal to indulge. Because Mother Nature is not your mother. She's your corrupted fallen sister. <laughs> then we got hormones coursing through our veins. See, si habla español, hormones. These hormones... Between the ages of 12 to 17, sex hormones increase 600%. I know. We're trying to get a meaningful education during all of that. <sighs> and these hormones, they make you feel sexual. But they're not released, these hormones, from your glands. They're not released from 12 to 17 in a nice little IV, IV drip daily dosage for convenient management. But they're released in waves uh, and rhythms. And some days your hormonal tide is low and you don't feel any sexual pressure. And you think, I've been delivered from that demon of lust. <laughs> and then... Of course, you can cast out all the demons you want. You cannot cast out your hormones. And so, two weeks later, the urge to merge begins to surge in your... Thank you so much. Anyway, I'm so glad you could relate. But anyway, 
that urge to merge begins to surge and you feel like a werewolf and people will cry out They'll cry out in some purity message or in some young adult group at the altar, Oh, take away this battle with lust, God. Oh, oh, take away these feelings. Take it away, God. I don't want to offend you. And I think God would say, No, dear, you have it wrong. I take away guilt, not humanity. And by my divine design, you are laced with hormones that make you feel sexual. And I don't take that away. I give you grace over here and guidelines over here. And in the middle, you will learn to grow up and become a responsible steward for what you think and feel. I will be with you to help you walk in freedom. You see, a culture that says, but I have to be true to my feelings. I have to be authentic. No, dear. Nowhere in the Word of God does God suggest you be true to your feelings. He suggests you be true to Him in spite of your feelings. We all have feelings, and integrity and purity are not the absence of feelings. It's how we manage them. So you can own it. It's good mental health to admit you're attracted. But attractions prove to be temporary unless you keep reinforcing and indulging that. That's why we pick up a cross. That's why we crucify flesh. That's why we say no to this to say yes to this. And that's why we become responsible stewards of mind and body. He doesn't take it away. We learn to bow down and obey. But that may take practice, and that's okay. We're not earning love. We're not earning salvation. We're learning to grow up as responsible stewards for what we think and feel and do. Agreed? He's for our success. And so, so I don't offer the parts of your body as instruments of unrighteousness like you used to. And the real members here that are sexual are not my private parts. It's probably my imagination, the last bastion to surrender. In fact, you know that old song, I Surrender All? should be retitled, I Surrender, incrementally at best. But God will take that. <laughs> He's in it for the long haul. And then, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Hey, Si, your body belongs to me. Uh, you claim my name, I claim your body for my dwelling place. Therefore, he goes on to say, do not misuse it sexually. So it becomes incumbent upon me to find out what is God's definition of misusing my body sexually. Not what I think, not what my culture thinks. My culture changes its opinion all the time. But God's got a transcendent truth of wisdom that if I walk on it, it will benefit me. I will not hurt you. And I will walk forward in a greater freedom than if I bow down to my flesh. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And finally, Ephesians 4 Put off your old corrupted self, Sigh. The inference is, I'm not judging you that you have a corrupted self. We're just owning the truth. Put it off and then in its place, put on the new and better way. You see, part of this problem that keeps us struggling and limits our freedom is because we have trained our brains toward bent forms of pleasure. The brain loves pleasure. God made it that way. You like chocolate? Even if you never read it again, your brain will never forget you loved it. And given a chance, you would return to it because your brain loves pleasure. And sex is very pleasurable, both physically and emotionally. And so your brain doesn't care if you were naughty before Christ, sleeping around and crossing boundaries. Your brain only recognizes that bought me pleasure. And so now that you're wanting to walk seriously with God, you know morally you ought not to do it, but the want to do it remains in your brain. And this creates a conflict called the war with the flesh. But not this flesh. The problem is the pattern in your brain. Because the blood of Jesus washes away guilt, not chemically reinforced patterns. But if I can train my brain in ways that are self-defeating, I can retrain that brain in ways that work in my favor and take me down a path to freedom. So it's kind of like this. If I built a freeway that takes me to a self-defeating destination, uh, there, that freeway will never be dismantled in my brain. But I can take an off-ramp called however and not arrive there, but arrive at another location like this. I'm so mad I can slap your face off. However... The Bible says not to give full vent to my anger. That might even be more regrettable than being mad right now. So I'm going to calm down. We'll have a chat and I'm going to talk to my lawyer. Or I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. I feel overwhelmed. However, God is with me. He will help me. And he puts skin on it. I'm going to call a friend and I'm going to get some reality check here because I'm not perceiving this very well. I may be afraid, however, I can reckon with it instead of it reckoning with me. Or, all those years of theater finally paid off. 
I'm so lonely and so horny and I really, really hate this feeling. However, I am not going to go to the bar and get drunk and hook up because that will make me feel worse. I'm going to call God, I'm going to talk to Him, and I'm going to get a reminder that He loves me, and then I'm going to call my accountability partner, and I'm going to arrive at a better place and not be exploited. That is how you put off the old by putting on the new through the powerful pivot called, however, I get to own one truth and then I pivot toward the bigger, better truth. Not too late to retrain that brain. Satan cannot make you do it, but he gives you opportunities to choose it. Satan knows if you grew up without daddy's love, he'll offer you bread that satisfies. That's why sin is so pleasurable, because it meets need. That's why temptation knows our name and offers us bread. He's also able to deceive us, Satan. And so uh, I remember the... Christian who came to me one time, the married man, who said, Pastor Sai, is adultery always wrong? I said, you're not wanting to be philosophical, are you? I said, what happened? He said, well, you know, my wife and I don't love each other anymore, but my secretary and I just have this anointed connection, and we're in a relationship, and I wanted to know your thinking, that is adultery always wrong? And I said, well, you know, uh, fair enough, sometimes we have to chew through the word to kind of get to what God is saying, but I thought he was clear on this one, you know. <laughs> It's like in the Ten Commandments, don't do that. And uh, there's no asterisk at the end of the command saying, adultery may be permitted under these circumstances. And... <laughs> now look, as you and I would agree, adultery is no laughing matter because it hurts people. That's why God has parameters around our feelings and our sexuality because he doesn't want us to hurt ourselves and other people. But you know, at the same time, I have seen marriages burned to the ground that have been restored out of adultery because God can redeem everything we give him and even if the marriage doesn't survive the individuals involved can be plucked from the fire and they can be recalibrated with newer healthier foundations and they can grow forward in God's redemption because he redeems everything we give him he writes redemption over mistakes King David Samson Sexual misadventure, anointing and appointing did not stop them, but they came to their senses, returned to the Father who restored anointing and appointing, speaking to us in the 21st century that God's ability to redeem our mistakes and misadventures is bigger than our ability to make them, so always run back to Him. In fact, that brings us to this idea about dealing with the devil. The real issue here, I said to this man, I wish you'd just tell me the truth. The fact of the matter is, you're, you're willing to trade away the life you've lived and, and your marriage because your heart and your flesh want this other woman. That's the truth. But when you're trying to rationalize it, I'm concerned. Because when you're saying, did God really say, I can't have it, you're hearkening back to a voice in the garden that got the mess started. So there's nothing wrong with using your good critical thinking skills to find out if what God said is true. But when you're wanting to rationalize... Is a God of love going to deny me something so satisfying and loving? And if love is love and God is love, then how could this be boundary crossing? And so you've got to be careful who you're listening to. And that's why God invites us into a posture of submission. It is not a one-off event when we get saved. That is the beginning of an initiated posture of bowing to him instead of other things. So I'm not bowing to the voice of the devil who lacerates me with the words of the bully that make me feel inadequate and inferior because they may call my name, but God calls my name and I'm bowing to his words of love. Life. I'm no longer bowing to the idea of a dysfunctional family trying to put qualifications above me so that I'll ever measure up and be uh, you know, adequate enough. Instead, God has given me a different standard and he is backing me with his love and I'm bowing to him. And when Satan makes a claim or ma calls my name in that dark garden, I am reminded of Jesus who was the second Adam in the second garden called Gethsemane. And the first Adam failed in the first garden, but Jesus was under the pressure of his life not to bow down. He did not say in that garden, hallelujah. I'm about to be crucified and tortured for these things I did not do, but that's the will of God. Bring it on. He said, get me out of this. I don't want my flesh to be persecuted. But then he changed the history of the universe, your life and mine, when he said, in spite of what my flesh wants, in spite of my fear, in spite of wanting to indulge my own interests, I'm going to bow to God's interests. And you and I are in the room because Jesus submitted to God when he did not want to. And in a less dramatic way, I am not the Christ, but I am his follower. And there have been times when Satan has put a target on my back. Don't you think? Don't you think he'd love to trip me up? Don't you think he'd like to rub my face in all of that failure so that he could say, aha, as could my critics? But instead, there have been those times under pressure, and yet I have a 37-year-old marriage. 
I am a daddy and a granddaddy, and I have a global ministry because in spite of my flesh and all of its vulnerability to me, the path of freedom and the key that unlocked that door of freedom was bowing down to God in my own dark garden when I didn't want to. Saying no to this enables me to be here saying yes to you. Saw you walk by the Spirit, you will then therefore not satisfy the cravings of your flesh. You'll walk in freedom. You may have cravings, but if you submit to me and my word, then you will walk above it. In other words, don't just try to stop it. That's not your goal. Your goal isn't the negative. It's the positive. If I'm walking with God, then I am fulfilling the path of freedom. And I can say no to it. Finally. And there is a finally. Here, I find the biggest reason why people struggle sexually is because of history. They have been starved of love, and they're hungry. They're hungry to be loved. And many times people have been wounded. Can I tell you that when I came to Christ, I walked away from the only bread I had ever known. And I don't know, you think I'm a strong cup of coffee today? You should have been in the skin of the men and women in that church 40 years ago. And they would have felt inadequate to know what to do, but they loved me well, and it was especially the men in my church. My problem wasn't with girls. I understood masculine attraction to the feminine, but before boys grow up into men who have the capacity to rightly love women, they have to bond with their own gender to properly form secure identity, and I had missed out. One childhood robbed me, and I now had a new father in a new family with a new opportunity to have the blank spots filled that I could grow forward. That's why it's relationships that save you. It isn't going to be rules and rituals. It's going to be relationship. God and God with skin on. This communion and this communion. Jesus paid a high price that I could feed my need with the good bread. And so the men in my church, they held me, they hugged me, they loved me, they touched me. They took me to the men's camp, the men's retreat, the men's Bible study, and the men's breakfast. And they proved to me I had value to them. And it did not have to include exploitation. And it changed my life. Finally, the healing of the soul, God knows how. It took God 10 years before he put his finger on the issue of my childhood sex abuse. I finally grew to a point of maturity, stability, where that addressing could be productive. And I went to a therapist, and he helped me walk through like God with skin on. I had the support of friends and family, colleagues too, but I had a professional help me map out the way forward that I could walk in freedom today. And the Holy Spirit said to me, your daddy sees this, and your daddy's sorry, and he wept and broke over what had been taken from me. You know why that mattered, ladies? Out of a billion things God could have said or thought to do, I had never known that my suffering mattered to anybody. And when God let me know it mattered to him because I mattered to him, that was more powerful than being wounded, was being wanted and given justice before him. And he wept over me, and no one had ever wept over me. He didn't take away my history to make it painless. Instead, he entered into my pain and carried it with me forward up and out of a ditch of distrust. And there he turned a wound, not just into a thing that had crippled my ability to love and trust, and he allowed me not just to survive it, but then I began to heal, and then I began to thrive, and he turned the wound into a great big wellspring for a global ministry that makes the devil pay for ever having conspired to rip me off, and he will let you walk in that freedom. He says in Psalm 107, I satisfy your craving the right way. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, it is going to happen for you, that healing. But the wise will understand there's a time and a purpose for everything, even if right now it seems to weigh heavily upon you. That's not the permanent condition. God will lead you in freedom, his way and time. So on that note, I will conclude. But I will conclude it with this. In LA, I was doing a message, and we had a time for questions and answers, and people wrote their questions down. Remember that on paper with like a writing instrument? <laughs> and the question filtered its way up to me, and this is the beautiful thing in the question. He said, Dear Pastor Sai, I grew up in a Christian family, but I did not want the faith of my parents, and I thought I knew what would make me happy. So I wandered away from faith, but now these years later, I find myself in a very dark place. What would you tell me to do? I thought about it. Then I said to him, kind of like an instinctive reaction as a daddy, I said, I know what I'd say. If you were my kid, I would say, come home. We can figure all this other stuff out in due course. But first, won't you come home? 
That's what God says to all of us. If you've got an issue in your life on the left-hand column, this is the path you bring it home because that's the path of freedom. This is the path of what it means to be a believer. You're going to depend on God to bring you through. You're going to discern his voice above all the others. You're going to learn to grow up and possess your mind and body responsibly. You will walk out a path of freedom through submission to him instead of submitting to other things. And therefore, you will find greater connection and communion from him and with God with skin on in the family of faith. And that will bring you through in spite of all the risks out there and the vulnerabilities in here. That will be the path of freedom for you. At least that's what's worked for me. And it's been my pleasure to invest it. Hey, man, did you survive? Roller coaster? He talks quick. You might have to watch that about three times. But let's go ahead and stand. Some incredible revelation from someone who has really had to dig deep and apply the scriptures to see if it works. And it did. Some of the things he said here. Not talking isn't making us holier or healthier, and that's why right now there's a chance for someone to pray with or in our prayer meetings throughout the week. That's or even just connect groups. Everything is around what he's saying. Talk, expose, and then bring it into correction with God's truth that frees us. Uh, you're born again, born again with the capacity to walk rightly, but it's a process. Meaning. As he said, you're saved 10 minutes, but <laughs> there's a long way to go. Uh, and so that's encouraging because that puts us on a journey. I think one of the biggest things for me was as a young person, he realized that he had experienced dysfunctional love, connection. He had been given bad bread, uh, not the daily bread that God would have him uh, have or designed him to have, but he, he took bad love over no love. Uh, and so I don't know where you're at, um, but I think this is an incredible uh, way to move forward. It applies to everyone because we all desire love, all need love. Uh, and as he said, we have communion with God, but also with people. God's design was that we would have communion and connect with people in the same way we connect with him. And so right now we're going to go into a time of communion. Uh, and it's essentially we remember God's love for us. He didn't. As, as Sai said, he didn't say hallelujah when he was in the garden. He, he, he cried out for help. He cried out for God's love, his strength, and he got what he needed through prayer. And he told us to, to remember him and what he'd done on the cross through the breaking of his body and to take the wafer or the bread and then to take the juice uh, for the blood that was shed. Why? So we could connect back to his sacrificial love that frees us that changes us, that protects us, that breaks the generational curses, breaks the wounds that have, that have hurt us and destroyed us or caused us to build things which are dysfunctional and God wants to, to sink those ships and to build a new one which will sail into places of freedom, of strength, of godliness. And so right now, I'm just going to pray and we're going to go into one more song of worship. God, we just pray and thank you as we take communion, we remember what you've done and what you sacrificed yourself, your body, your blood was shed for our sins, but not just to save us and that we would become born again, but that we would get on a process of sanctification, that we would get better and trust you more and more. God, we would see your love walk with us all the days of our life as we continue to grow and become more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we sing this song, you're welcome as a believer to come forward and partake in communion. And also we've got a, a great prayer team in the back. would love to just pray with you and encourage you. Let's worship.
God, we just pray and thank you, Father, that you are a redeemer. That, God, your love changes us. It fills us. It satisfies us, God. And I thank you that your truth keeps us free. And so, God, I just pray, Father, that your word would go forth this morning and strengthen our soul. God, that your word would guide us and that your love would change us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Okay, you may take a seat as we transition into uh, a chance where we get to worship with our giving. I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Obviously, we spoke about it earlier, um, that we were able to extend our car parking facility because of your generosity. Uh, and so I really appreciate your ties and your offerings. Uh, really, you know, why do we do it? We do it for stories. Uh, we're, all, we all, we're all sigh. We're all in reality, we all have a need in our soul, uh, and God is the answer, we believe. And He created us with purpose, He created us with need uh, for good bread, and he, he provides us that as well. And so the church exists for that purpose, that we would know the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit through what Christ done on the cross. Uh, and so thank you for generosity. If you want to give, uh, most people give online. There'll be a video in a second just to show you how to do that with their tithes and offerings. And then there's a wee box on the way out on the right if you want to give in person. You're welcome to do so. Also, if you sign up to Gift Aid online, we get to claim back uh, 25% of what you give uh, of the taxes that you've paid. Uh, but that's us. Let me just pray. God, I thank you, Father, uh, for our church generosity, Father, in building your house, your kingdom, to see people's lives transformed, uh, renewed, so they can bring a message of hope to the world we live in. In Jesus' name. Uh, man, if you just pay your attention to the screen. you can hear me yeah so I'm just gonna finish off today with a few announcements then um, so firstly it is groups week this week so if you're not connected in with a group then um, why don't you go speak to the girls in the connect desk on the way out and they can give you an overview of what's what we have we have um, study groups we have young adults um, we have walking groups so there's a load out there for you to get involved in and you'd be made very welcome if you were to come along so please do um, we also have have um, serve day which pastor phil was talking about on the 22nd so that's going to be a saturday we're going to meet at about 10 a.m a couple of hours just to go out into our community do some gardening do some litter picks and really connect with people out there and make a difference in our community so please come along if you are free families um, kids all welcome as well so it'd be great to see you there um, we also have our church barbecue on the 30th of July, so that'll be in Guildford. We'll just have food, there'll be bouncy castle, there'll be games, one for all the family as well. So please do get that in your diary and come along with that for that as well. Um, we've got our connect cards, which are pointed you towards as well. So if you are um, want it new to here and you want to get to know us a bit better and values um, and to get involved then fill one of those in and fill it um, pop it to on the connect desk on the way out there's a little gray box there that you can just pop it into and there's also be a little treat if you do fill that in um, there is no youth on um, so no youth in July back in August and just around the compassion are doing a uniform drop as well so when you came in you maybe saw some of the uniform items so if you do have any spare items hopefully on the screen there it shows you what schools that we're involved in um, that we're collecting for so a variety of items that can include um, just your skirts your shirts um, bags anything that you have that could be given to someone else please do drop them in this week or next week 
Um, except for that, give us a follow on social media if you haven't already. Best way to keep up to date with everything that's going on in the church. And except for that, have a great week and hope to see you next week. Thank you.